Okay. Welcome, everybody. Our agenda is up on the board. <laughs> Everybody's had a good day today. We're technical difficulties, like always, but we're starting. Um, so first on our agenda, welcome, everybody. Does anybody have any outperforming moments they could share with us? Yes. So the UTSA CFA Institute Research Challenge team made it to regional finals. So that's a pretty good deal. Right. Congratulations. Bye. As for them, anybody else? I'm just kind of curious about what that is. Research challenge? Yeah. So are you familiar with the CFA Institute? No. They offer a certification called Chartered Financial Analysts. Oh, okay. and they put on a research challenge for universities globally to compete. And basically, you write an equity research report, turn it in, and then when you make it to the next round, you get to present it to a panel of judges. Uh, and then you just kind of work your way up to nationals and then global. Congratulations. Thank you. Congrats, y'all. Get together with Colin. Yes, yeah. And after the meeting to learn more about the CFA challenge. Yeah, yeah, back there. Okay. And quote for today is don't stay in bed unless you can make money in bed. Um, start investing. That's the best way to get some passive income while you're sleeping. And fortunately for me, I started investing in 2020, so everything was down, right? So everything's up now, well, compared to 2020. Um, so passive income is key, y'all. Invest right now, even if it's a dollar, five dollars, twenty dollars, it grows. And next, sign in, everybody. For those in person and who have paid their dues, if y'all sign in by scanning the QR code, you will enter the gift card raffle of twenty-five dollars. There's two winners, like always. Is it working or? Okay, that's on my end, my bad. Okay, y'all can go ahead and scan again. Sorry about that. Thumbs up when y'all are done signing in. Thank you. Okay, perfect. And on, okay, so last, week's meeting the dues were on sale but now they are not so now if you would like to join for two semesters it's forty dollars it's a small slight increase i know and then one semester is due is twenty five dollars and the final actual deadline for these dues is i put may but it's march march 9th um, this is in a couple of weeks, and this is to allow you to do the sectors and classes you would really like to join and say if you want to pay the dues or not. I don't know. Worth it or well, not. Um, there's that. You could either pay through PayPal or Zelle. If you have any questions, just reach out to me after the meeting. And on to our scheduled program of the meeting, uh, my market outlook with Anthony. Hello, everyone. How y'all doing tonight? Good. Cool. Meeting number two. Let's get it. So here's a breakdown of what we're going to cover. We're going to hit our markets, some earnings, some news. And so we're going to be doing um, things a little bit different um, for this week and uh, going forward. I love these graphs. They're super clean and Quickly, you can tell what's going on. And so we have the S&P 500. It came in at $4,410. This is for a negative 1.1% decrease. We have S&P small cap 600 at 1301. That's for a uh, 0.8 decrease. We have the Russell 3000 growth. It's at 2,148. This is for a 0.6 decrease. And this is from our meeting last week. So we can start tracking from meeting to meeting and seeing what's going on. Next, we have the um, Russell 3000 value. This is 2109.93. And that's a 0.9 decrease as well as we see all markets are getting drugged down. 
Uh, we have the NASDAQ composite that's at 13,790. We have the Nike 225, this is $27,079. This is for a 1.5 decrease. We have the Vanguard developed markets ETF is for 4890. That's for a Point one increase. We have the BlackRock iShares Emerging Market ETF. It's for $48. That's a 0.8 increase. We have oil. This is the big one. Uh, West, West Texas, 94.94 for a 3% increase from last week. We got gold at 1,872, 1.5 increase. And BTC we got Bitcoin at 42,233. And so once again, these, these graphs are, are super great. We can see from right here our um, price change year to date. Oil's the big mover there, as you can see from the price change in the last 12 months. Um, it's up 70.4%. Another uh, story here to investigate um, would be the growth stocks. And so I, I really like this right here as well. So here's all our sectors. Um, we have uh, information technology came in at 27.16. We have energy. It's down 1.1% as well. It came in at 5.22. We have financials at 6.58. It's down 1.5%. We got consumer um, discretionary at 14.31. We got consumer staples at... 7882, that's 1.4% decrease. Seems I had a little mix up on this when I was making it. And so we have um, healthcare for a 2.1% decrease. We have industrials for a 0.7 decrease. Materials, excuse me, we got utilities at 3.5% negative decrease. And so these charts, again, we um, keep seeing the story with uh, energy and financials up. I, I think um, some of the story there is uh, what's going to happen with these inflation rates. So here's a heat map I found of crypto last night. Um, it's, it's pretty nice to where you can see the stable coins to your uh, altcoins as well as down to some of the lower tokens. I had, and for everyone, um, I didn't forget the ether. There it is at 3146. That's for a negative 1.22%. And this is all of, uh, as of midnight. Here's our sector heat map. And so this really helps me um, from week to week as I start kind of connecting the dots in my mind as I hear a company um, such as Navita. Um, I see this heat map in my mind. I start um, lining up the sectors. And then it helps me um, paint a bigger picture as well as uh, establish my position going forward. And so some of these key indexes um, for these sectors uh, we've seen was the large cap core. That's SP 500. We got the large cap growth. This is the Russell 1000 growth index. And the key here is higher price to book ratios and higher forecasted growth rates. We got large cap value. Same situation, lower price to book ratios and lower forecasted growth, and of course, small cap. And so going over those definitions helps me when looking at, um, excuse me, this um, style return graph. As we can see, uh, this one's a little bit different from the one I showed last week as it's focusing on these uh, more specialized sectors or indexes. And so here's a, another graph showing that if you would have took um, $100, thousand dollars over the last 20 years and set it in each one of these uh, this is where you would line up this also kind of tells a story that diversification and meaning that diversified portfolio that definitely um, helps uh, diversify your risk i really like this this is the most anticipated earnings um excuse me so there's a lot of really good companies in here uh, I see Shopify, Yeti, and I, I was mainly concerned with COVID-born 
not necessarily COVID born companies, but companies that were affected by COVID and how they did. And of course, we're, we're seeing that right now with um, DoorDash, Airbnb. I know I just booked me one. And so we have Airbnb. They reported a Tuesday after close, their estimated EPS was 0 or 0 0.05. We have DoorDash Wednesday close, estimated negative 0 0.27. Navita estimated dollar and a cent. And then we got Planetar. They are at 0 0.04. And so here's a, a, another graph that kind of shows whether they, these are the ones that came in today that I followed up with prior to the meeting. I wanted to capture what they were actually doing. And as we can see that trade desk, they beat. Um, Shopify, looks like they missed on EPS, missed on Rev, you got Crocs. I don't know if anybody's wearing any, but, um, and then we got Wix, um, they missed. And so the big earning spotlight, I'll touch on this real quick, is DoorDash. Um, they're, they're surged on big numbers. I know I ordered a wing stop a few days ago, and then I checked my bank account the next day, and it was $70. I was like, wow, what the heck? And then so NVIDIA, um, they've seen their profits double. They're doing really well as we see everything transitioning more to tech. They're definitely going to be higher in demand. So here's some of our earnings next week. We got Macy's. They got an estimated EPS 1.98, Medtronic 1.37. Cracker Barrel, 1.62, and Krispy Kreme Donut. Um, I like that one just because I always find um, tickers kind of interesting. And then they got a real cool one right there. So some of the big news um, that's going on and that has been affecting some of the markets, uh, mainly tech dragging it down, is, has been what's going to go on with some of these inflations and, and kind of some of the, as they said before, it was transitory. Now they're going to start uh, revving up. And so we'll see how this can play out in the next few uh, weeks or weeks. Um, it's kind of been a developing situation uh, daily. And so the other news story, uh, if you've seen it on several different publications, is what's going on with the Russian Federation and uh, Ukraine. And so we can see here from 1985 how much. Russia's involvement in the world, their production plays a key. And this is with natural gas and other things as well. So I, I wish I could see a more zoomed in version to where I could get and see some of the other dips as they coincide with um, US shale production. And so I, I figured something was pretty cool. I gave my my wife, uh, my 1099s to take into her work so I could file my taxes. And so here's some of my trades. And they kind of tell a story. You can see I, I bought some Bitcoin. Um, it's slowly uh, going down. And, and though they say it's theoretically possible to catch a falling knife, you probably shouldn't. And I made a couple other good trades uh, for some minimal things here and there. I needed the money to put somewhere else. And you can see I, I had some losses with Dogecoin. If y'all have any cool ones, even if you're making paper trades, share them. We can feature it. Uh, I think it's pretty cool to show some live trades. And so here we are. Do we got anybody that, that's been following along on the book? Anybody able to read or has read it before? And so uh, the random walk, this um, actually, that's the next one. And so the front foundation, um, it states, the theory stresses a, a stock's value ought to be based upon the stream of earnings. A firm will be able to distribute in the future a form of dividends or stock buybacks. Some notable pioneers is Benjamin Graham, uh, Mr. Dodd, and I think the Oracle, he uh, perfected it a few years after them. And it also focuses on the stock's intrinsic value. Second part, um, this relates to the quote she showed earlier is John Maynard Keynes. Uh, he basically was investing from his bed, bed for, let's say, a couple of hours every morning. And so the Castle and the Aries theory, um, excuse me, is it, it's a little bit different. The, the success, the, the investor, if y'all have heard the story where in, in the 1950s, they were voting on people that are pretty or they fancy in the newspaper. And so you're not 
betting on who you think is the prettiest, but on the population would figure it's going to be who they fancy. And so a lot of it is based upon mass psychology, you know, buying the news is the famous John Maynard Keynes. And so lace up for next week. That will be the madness of crowds. I hope I'm going to be working on this in the next few days. I hope to have the Market Watch competition up. Please, if you're watching at home or in here, this is just an example of what will be going on. It should be very similar to passwords and, and nomenclature. If you'd like to follow me and keep up with some Excel stuff, you can follow me there on uh, TikTok. Thank you. All right, great job, Anthony. Today, I think I'll be giving probably one of my favorite presentations just because of there's a level of absurdity to it. So we're, first, we're going to go over, can Bitcoin become a national currency? We're going to take a look at El Salvador and whatever is going on there. Um, and we're going to take a look at the updates on Russia and Ukraine, see what's going on over there, um, see what's going to unfold in the next few days. And Eduardo Style is going to be recommending something to you. This week will be a podcast. And next week, I'll try to do a documentary. So last September, El Salvador made Bitcoin legal tender, and they're now aiming to raise a billion dollars to fund expansive economic policies. Their economic plan will be a billion dollars towards bonds that will be backed by Bitcoin. These bonds are 10-year bonds with a coupon of 6.5%, and they're looking to roll them out uh, as soon as like late this month or early March. So half of that money would be used to buy Bitcoin and hold it for the next five years. And the rest, <laughs> it's my favorite part, they would be used to fund construction progress related to Bitcoin. We'll go into that a little bit later. So the construction progress is called Bitcoin City. Um, they want to build a city center around Bitcoin. The city plans to include no taxes on income, property, or no capital gains taxes. Um, I'm not sure how to say this, this name, but the president... Um, He's attempting to attract Bitcoin mining companies and people that want to buy or mine Bitcoin by themselves. China recently outlawed it. Um, they're not allowing people to mine Bitcoin anymore. So he's hoping to uh, bring people here where they can mine it. Of course, no taxes. Uh, they can mine freely. And this is also great. <laughs> they plan to have it powered by a nearby extinct volcano. Um, uh, I'm no scientist. I'll, I'll let you guys figure that one out. Um, here it is. Keep in mind, this guy right here is their president. Um, I love it. This guy, backwards, backwards baseball cap, um, unbuttoned shirt. Uh, this guy is a self-proclaimed, the coolest dictator on earth. <laughs> That's cool. I, I gotta love it. Um, not sure how it'll play out, but we'll see. So they're, they're negotiating right now with the IMF. Um, they they want to get $1.3 billion um, for a financial aid program. However, the IMF is pretty much saying no. They don't want people or they don't want countries adopting crypto as national currency, mostly because um, the lack of a central bank. And there's no authority. They can't really regulate it. Plus, they can't make loans off with that uh, cryptocurrency. So El Salvador is likely going to be turning away from them if they end up going through with their bonds issued in Bitcoin, uh, which it plans as they're doing. So how is Bitcoin actually being used in El Salvador? Here we have a picture of some uh, local, local shops selling shoes. It says it accepts Bitcoin, but from all the studies, it says the day-to-day -day use is actually pretty rare. And a recent survey said that 70% of El Salvadorians do not trust the government's move. Um, I believe yeah, you said that he tweeted something that he was making these trades on his phone with pretty much taxpayer money. Um, I wouldn't trust the guy either <laughs> if I was living there. So the future of El Salvador, um, really only time will be able to tell looking at the um, volatility of Bitcoin. It really only time will tell. There's, um, it's been extremely volatile. I don't know how you could necessarily back a country's economy on it, um, especially if they plan to hold this Bitcoin for five years. It's a giant gamble, but 
if anyone's going to do it, it's that guy. So I have a quick opinion right here. Um, anytime I have an opinion, I want to voice that out, make it clear. So I personally, with the leadership of him, the lack of trust from the citizens, the volatility of Bitcoin in the past the past year, past all the crashes and all that, I don't think the country will hold up the way it hopes to. But if you look on the bright side, though, I think their whole Bitcoin city has great potential to attract entrepreneurship into the city. Um, hopefully something can come out of that and the country won't be doomed. So I'm going to update Russia and Ukraine. This will probably be the last time that I will unless someone actually invades. Because if you've been keeping up with it, um, they're going to invade. They're not going to invade. This guy said this. This guy said that. So this will be my last update. But there's some, there's some cool stuff in here. So the U.S. advised all U.S. citizens in Ukraine to uh, flee immediately. Uh, I'm not, don't want to try to pronounce this, but if you can see the cursor. This is where the embassy is located right here. Um, they advised everyone to flee, to get out of there, go back to the U.S. or flee to one of the surrounding countries that's safe. And Jake Sullivan, the America's, America's national security advisor, said that a war could happen as soon as tomorrow. Um, he said this yesterday. So they were expecting it to happen today, um, unless something is happening as I speak. Nothing's came out of it. They also said Monday on Valentine's Day that they were expecting it to happen then. But like I said, nothing has really happened. Um, this is kind of funny. A Russian spokesman responded, we need to stop believing everything that they say in Washington, especially regarding Ukraine. Um, some of their comments have been pretty funny. They've just been kind of making fun of the U.S.'s involvement saying that they don't know what they're talking about and they're trying to kind of water down the whole situation either to attack or if they're really being honest that nothing's going to come out of it. So yesterday, Russia attacked Ukraine with a cyber attack. Uh, whether this was from the government or it was some Russian hackers is um, I still being researched. There's been some stuff like this that has happened in the past, but I think this has been the biggest one. Um, their Ministry of Defense and Armed Forces website, along with two state-owned banks, were attacked. They went in and somehow they, uh, they made all their statements and their balances appear at zero, and they froze some of the assets. I'm not entirely sure how long this lasted, but it was the first attack by Russia on Ukraine. And uh, right now, Russia has 130,000 troops gathered along the Ukraine border. They have 30,000 troops in Belarus for military training. I thought this was really cool. Um, I was speaking to Anthony before this. He's a big Air Force guy. But if you go on Twitter, there's this account, Flight Radar 24, that will give you live updates on one of the drones that is flying along the border, uh, capturing U.S. intelligence. I kind of thought it was interesting that you can find this on Twitter. Um, I'm not on Twitter, but when I tried to look, it said that it was currently, um, the link was like currently frozen, either due to activity or myself not having a Twitter account. I wasn't too sure. But it's revealed military activity in the Ukraine skies. Um, this, along with military reports, is how they've got an estimate of um, troop counts, planned attacks, and things like that. So, yeah, it's flying in loops around Ukraine's border with Russia and Belarus. So there are U.S. troops in Ukraine, which I feel like is a big deal right now. Um, they sent 3,000 additional troops to Central Europe, fearing that Russia will invade at any time. These troops include that the, the paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne Division, or the 3,000 that were recently deployed. The Pentagon has alerted more than uh, 8,500 U.S. service members for possible deployment. And for now, they're preparing and expecting an invasion. Like I said, Russia's kind of watering us down. They're saying it's not going to happen. So unless between now and this week, um, Russia attacks or something major happens, I'll likely uh, be talking about something else because it's getting a little repetitive just kind of seeing who's going to do what. Lastly, my podcast recommendation. So I'm going to recommend the intelligence from The Economist. This is a daily listen for me. Uh, Fuck! A lot of my sources from here. Uh, it's really cool. It's about a 22 minute podcast, incredibly unbiased. Um, you listen to it, it's this like 
almost robot kind of guy that um, guides it, guides you through the podcast to like bring up certain uh, certain subjects, and they'll have experts come in. Incredibly informative, um, regardless of your interest in economics. It's providing useful stories um, regarding pretty much anything. So this is available on Spotify. Um, I'm not on any other platforms. I haven't looked, but it's one of the most common um, podcasts related to economics. So it should be available on most other platforms. So here's my LinkedIn if you'd like to connect with me on there. And my, here's my email. And lastly, starting uh, whenever the sector classes start, I will be posting an intro to Python class. If anyone's interested there, uh, I'm planning for this to be like absolutely no experience required. Um, pretty much if you have a computer, if you don't, you can just go to the class, log into um, one of the computers there. You get a basic understanding. And from that, um, the website that I'm doing it on provides modules for Python for finance and stuff like that. So you'll be able to get a groundwork to go into more finance related things. All right, and that's the end of my presentation. Here is Juan Carlos with mergers and acquisitions. Okay, so today we're going to talk about Cisco. First, we're going to talk about, uh, so we're talking about Cisco now. We're trying to purchase Cisco. But first, we're going to go through some background information in history and some of our biggest acquisitions to this day. So, first, we're going to start with the background. They were founded in 1984, and they're currently the biggest, uh, one of the biggest information technology companies. And during their time, okay, during their time they have uh, purchased over 200 firms. And this is basically some of the things they offer from optical cables for telephones to telephones chips and more. And one interesting fact about Cisco is that after the dot-com uh, bubble in 2002, they were the, were the most expensive company in the world. And they're sure we're in 2006. And they were worth $5 billion. What they're worth right now, which is $228 billion. OK, like other big corporations, it's going to find uh, companies in order to Extend their market share to the internet and other markets. And uh, it's interesting to think also that the first thing they ever saw was a chip in order to, for companies to connect. Uh, that, that was back in 84, and this was the first one they came out with. And obviously, now they're making big moves and entering the markets. And to start off, uh, one of their, their, uh, their biggest happens, their biggest acquisition is Serenity. And with Serum, they came up with the merger, which is kind of technical, but it's a box for people who put a lot of their internet manage the cables for internet, so it expands for commercial payments and stuff like that. And that was one of the best purchases as it became the fastest in the to reach a billion dollars in sales. Their second Fortune 500 company, top 10 biggest acquisitions in technology. And this is some of the things they did in the end of the time making, such as the cable television. Um, they also made rings for Wi Fi. And again, another interesting fact is that they sold for $600 million. But this is what we're going to do. And okay, now recent acquisitions. This is uh, kind of what I'm talking about how they are transferring into other markets. And recently, they've been uh, entering the 5G artificial intelligence, hyper infrastructure. They're trying to virtualize everything that's hardware, cybersecurity, and data processes. is fun. Okay, first, mind map. So, mind it's a company that uses uh, artificial intelligence in the way that Siri and Alexa does, which are apps and websites. And they also have a 
some website, it's an artificial intelligence that tries to like type of team within LinkedIn. They're trying to pair uh, people together uh, in whatever form. Trying to pair people together with artificial intelligence. Okay. And uh, they also bought Boise. Design, but they didn't disclose a price, and it's basically an app for them to transcribe everything that happens on their WebEx. Okay, this is another recent acquisition. This is more in the 5G space. Uh, they bought a Acacia for 2.6 billion, and Acacia owns a, they have probably one of the best cab uh, like cables for 5G. Billion for dual, and uh, it's basically an app that does not allow you to enter uh, into a, an account until you do like double verification. And since the executive said that, the, like the firms make their uh, like their customers safer. Double verify the thingy. Lastly, uh, Splunk. So recently also we've been talking about big data and how big corporations want to use big data and analyze big data. Splunk basically does that. They, through all the big data, they make patterns and graphics and that's also real time. So that helps uh, companies that want to look at their information in real time uh, accessible. And this is basically uh, the dashboard you can see whenever you're using Splunk. Okay, now price. Cisco made a twenty billion plus takeover offer, and uh, again, similar to last week when I talked about Microsoft, uh, the CEO didn't do anything wrong, but he uh, retired after six years. He made the company really strong, but he but he decided to retire because he thought that a new CEO could better help expand the company. But the markets and I guess the shareholders didn't like that. So that happened in November, and since it has 24%. Its current market cap is 19.6 billion. It's, the stock has been also very volatile. Back in January 27, it was worth 17.4 billion. And before the CEO uh, retired and they chose a new CEO, the company was actually worth 26.7 billion. And uh, like I mentioned, the CEO left after he left the stock went down. So this is similar to uh, Microsoft. And uh, basically, they haven't yet said if the takeover is actually going to happen, but uh, I thought it was interesting now. It's kind of like a, a pattern we see here where companies wait for a company to have a really big dip in price before making an offer. And um, I guess they thought uh, uh, Splunk's um, business model will help them also. So we're waiting for them to see if they're actually going to buy it. But if it happens, it's going to be Cisco's biggest acquisition. And that's it. Then, if you want to connect, or they will see takeover offer mid. The takeover offer was made about two days ago, exactly two days ago. What was the market reduction that day for the stock? It went up a bit, not that much. Probably like two, three percent. So, yeah, it increased uh -huh. two, three percent, not that much. And yeah, that's it. Any more questions? Perfect. Now time for Mr. Sweet with the sweet spot. That's fine. All right. Yeah. Who's introducing Ramsey? Yeah. Well, we do have an honored guest. <laughs> yes, I see John back there. Where's your tie, man? Oh. <laughs> so John Toys. MZ, former MDs. Uh, he's he's actually historic. His historical figure at UTSA. He is the first ever College of Business Honors School graduate. He was the very first graduate of the. Which I teach that class, so we got people after Collins in that school too. You all. So so welcome, Ramsey. Um, all right, we've got we're getting really close on the schedule here. Um, this is a lot of classes, so this is really, really impressive. We have 
what I think is really impressive, we have three freshmen teaching a class, which I think is really, really impressive. Uh, someone steps out before they've even had a finance class. Um, well, once we get it finalized, we'll post it on the doors. We're only going to have one Zoom account that you can get into, but we'd rather you be there. It's a lot better. What I recommend that you do is just pick one and go and commit to just going every week. Uh, there's a competition, you know, the best class teachers get a scholarship. And so, you know, you as a student, go support them. It's a good networking opportunity. Get to know people. Um, you know, it's an opportunity in a smaller group to get to know people. We can learn Python. Uh, Anthony's going to teach a capital IQ class. We've got Tableau, which is very, very important. It's a couple of Excel classes in here. Our sectors are in there. Um, some Bloomberg classes, a few Bloombergs. We're going to try the fact exam review again. I keep getting students saying they want that, and then you see how many show up. So um, I encourage you to get involved, try it. Also, you need to be teaching a class, so this is a good chance to come observe what they do, figure out what they do, and what you think you could do differently, and then next semester you sign up as, as well. Some people like Larissa is doing two classes, you know, really going for it, jumping in. So, you know, this is opportunity. Uh, all you got to do is just show up in the FSC and just sit and listen and learn something. It gives you a huge advantage. You know, like, let's take Python. You have to clue what Python is. You're not going to learn Python in a semester. But if you go to an interview and say, yeah, you're taking a Python class that by itself and you know what it is, that helps you dramatically. Um, I just had a company call me today and said, hey, you know, anybody knows R, I really could use them. So if anybody knows R, come talk to me and I'll, I'll connect you with them. Um, so, you know, knowing coding can be really, really helpful. If, you know, my, my approach is I don't want to learn it unless I'm sure I'm going to use it because if I really, really learn Python, I'm probably going to forget it. But I want to know what it is so I can talk about an interview. And then when I get that first job, I want the boss that's going to force me to learn or Python or SQL or Java or something like that. So I can really, really learn this stuff and get some advantages. So come and listen. Any questions on, on these? Y'all see how this works? So we almost have more teachers than we have members. So we got to get bring members in. So encourage people to come participate and get involved. Um, so we'll kick off Monday, 1.30 with... A Python class, a second Python class on Tuesday. So we've we've got some good variety here. All right. So what I want to do is wait. Where am I? Where did my presentation go? All right. So I want to I want to hit three conventional things, conventional wisdom things I've heard in my career. Anytime I hear one, I like to go ahead and see if it's actually true, because people just quote it. So the first one is real, made really famous by Jeremy Grantham. I don't know, John, y'all talked about the presidential cycle at US, USA much after all that. I think I, think I saw one article y'all wrote about that. Um, so is there a cycle to stocks related to president? Have you, did, how many times y'all hear the NFL Super Bowl talking about stock market in the NFL? I think I heard it like five times. Anybody hear that? NFC wins, what happens? Stocks will be up, right? NFC wins. Stock, is that right? Isn't that it? That's if you make 20 different adjustments and it all works, you know, <laughs> what do you do with the Steelers, all this kind of stuff. So I guess the NFC won, didn't they? I can't keep track. I'm pretty sure Cleveland's AFC. So um, <laughs> does it matter if it was a close game? Does it mean the stock market? Do you think there's any relationship to the stock market? Some people have said, and I'm not sure about that. You know, there's more New York teams in the in the NFC. Well, I don't know if that's true either. You got the Jets, but somehow if the city of New York is happy, stocks will go up. But I don't think the Super Bowl extends for 12 months. I'm not sure people are that happy about it. So I don't think that goes. Uh, another one I've heard besides the presidential cycle is the January effect. So goes January. So goes the rest of you. Do you think that's true? January is up to January is up to seven months will be up. And you think you may think the same thing with that? Statistically, it's really only up. It doesn't do down very well since we don't have down as much. Yeah, there's not many stats on the downside, but we'll see. I'll show you the numbers. 
And why don't PE ratios and inflation? So Anthony has just talked about that. Stock and inflation is a relationship between stock market valuations and inflation. Of these three, which would you bet money on? And you can add any value to if you want to. Which would you? <laughs> if your uncle comes to you with a million dollars, you can have it as long as you put all of it on one of these four things. Which would you put your million dollars on? You have to do it for the next 10 years. Our PE ratios and inflation. Our PE ratios and inflation. Right? Yes. You want to do the NFL? Higher cost of AFC wins, you got to short stocks. If it, the NFL. Humans, you have to buy stocks. <laughs> Anybody want to bet on the presidential cycle? Let's look at the presidential cycle. So the presidential cycle says year three, which is next year, right? We're in year two. Year three is the best year to be in stocks. I'm not sure if that's the presidential cycle, other than it might be the congressional election cycle. That's when congressmen and women are like, you know, in the first year, in the election year, Hotels of the president, but in the third year, they got to get elected on the road to the big, 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 big city. So let's spend money. You know. So if you look historically, the third year has been much stronger than the other years. If you look before 2008, overwhelmingly. Pre 2008, the first year was only up. And this is back to 1926. I'm not doing this like back three years. The first year of the president, so 2020, right? 2021, boy, no, 2021. Biden's first year, stock market's historically been up about 7%. The second year, this is this year, up about 8%. Look how consistent that is. Next year, the third year, 19%. The fourth year, up 11 The fourth year, is getting the presidential cycle. What do you notice since 2008? It kind of fell apart, didn't it? <laughs> And Jeremy Franklin talk, talked about this. What happened since Obama? And I don't think you can, you can talk and say that it's Obama did anything, but the Fed certainly started acting a little different. Didn't they? Anybody heard of something called like QE, maybe? Oh, the, the, the Fed started doing stuff radically differently. That kind of, and so Jeremy Grantham says, you know, Jeremy Grantham, he actually not only did he talk about the cycle, we actually thought it was a real thing that you could actually invest money on. But he says, since Obama, it just and it didn't work under Trump. Is it working with uh, Biden? <laughs> uh, it's hard to say, but you know the first year has been a great year. Fourth year has been a horrible year, and the third year is just in the middle. So I say, yeah, it works until the Fed decided to print billions of dollars of money, and it has stopped working. What about January versus the rest of the year? So here's January. Here's the rest of the year. What is the slope of that line? It's a flat line. The correlation is 0 0.03. So I couldn't find a relationship. But I don't know, John, if you see a relationship between January and this year. There is, a, there is that January effect with small cap, right? People talk about that. That may be tax driven. Or, you know, some people say in December, you make sure you have the apples and the Googles and you know, whatever has been up. And then in January, you saw all those employers fucking. I think they almost disappeared too, from what I've seen. Some of the stuff just doesn't exist anymore. All right, so Ramsey was saying, let's go with uh, inflation and PE ratios. Y'all have seen this chart. This is a good old uh, case healer, you know, the case. Um, working? Oh. All right. So Case Schiller, he looks at P.E. ratios adjusted for inflation. So it's not exactly what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is going to be the next chart. But he says when you take earnings and you take prices and adjust them for earnings, but not actual earnings, but 10 years of earnings without inflation, which means why does he do that? So that you can compare 2020 to 1980. So 1980 looks low because inflation was high, but he's saying no. So what is he saying? Stocks are the second most expensive they'd ever been in their history. Only the dot-com time was more expensive. So kind of a scary time to be in stocks. But let's look at stocks versus inflation. So here's inflation down here. 
And here's the PE ratios. What do you notice when inflation's high? Stocks are pretty cheap. So this down here, I don't know if y'all can see this. This is, a, this is when I was in high school. And your parents may not have been born there. Y'all know I was alive during when Kennedy was assassinated. He, I was one years old. So I was alive during Johnson's administration. It's just hard to believe. John is like us thinking about people being alive during you know, Woodrow Wilson's <laughs> presidency or something. Uh, so, yeah, definitely. Huh? Fortunately, you're a few years older than me. I was only yeah. alive when they landed on the moon. Yeah, yeah. I still remember Johnson. You remember it. I was a baby. <laughs> Watching him on TV. All right. So there is no question when inter when inflation is high and interest rates are high, PE ratios are low. And you notice as inflation falls, PE ratios rise. And there's a pretty good relationship there. Here's a dot com. So the dot com inflation was pretty low. Valuations are really high. It's ridiculously high. Here's where we are today. And what you notice today is valuations are incredibly high given how high inflation is. So there's that big question. Is inflation transitory? If it is, then we're probably okay. If inflation is not transitory, then stocks. That's about as expensive as we've ever been. We're, we're in that expensive Place you see that consistent with with Schiller's chart. We're in that really expensive. Given where inflation is, we're a really expensive stock market. If inflation's really two percent still, stocks aren't that expensive. So that's the question. You see why we're transitory so If inflation's not transitory, stocks are ridiculously expensive. Is it transitory stocks? So you can go. I guarantee you stocks are going to be cheap. So I'm going to put my game on that. Are they well back on those three? <laughs> okay, any questions on that? I don't know how much time we're doing. We're doing well on time. Any questions on that? Next week, I'm going to do my, uh, Anthony, talk to me about this. I'm going to do my, what that is to do. I'm to do my top of your head. Some of you might have some class of seeing some of this, like, uh, let's see. I won't put Jose on the spot, but uh, who else is in that class? Gabby's in that class. So, what's the standard deviation of the daily movement in your treasury? Do you remember Jose? Standard deviation, Colin? Six and a half basis points. Six and a half basis points. So, two weeks ago, the ten-year treasury yield was up ten basis points. Was that a big day? That was a big day. Today, the what did the stock market do today? I don't remember. We just saw it. But what's the standard deviation of the stock market on a daily basis? Right at one percent. So if you have one and a half percent day, that's pretty big. Those are things I would want to know. If you walk into an interview and ten-year treasuries are ten bucks, and you don't know that's a big deal. You no, know, you can try. You can try faking it. They say, "Hey, what do you think about treasury?" Oh, yeah, wow, well, that was interesting, wasn't it? That's not what they want to hear. Wants you to say, man, ten bucks, boy, that's that's a that's a one and a half sigma event. That's a pretty rare. They want you to do stuff. As I tell students, you need to get to the point where you're not a student. Where you know when you see it, and you when you should gasp, and when you shouldn't be gasping. Well, that's a big number. What is ten basis points? Is a big number. I don't, the market. I think yields are down a couple basis points today. I can't remember. I was going to text Brian and tell him that it's okay for my mind. Mutual funds, like some of the price down a day, that would be nice because they've been doing nothing but going down the last several days because of what our interest rates doing. Where's the ten-year today? Is it above two? Still above two, right? That's a pretty big, pretty big deal. So there are certain things going to an interview. So I'll show you the ones I think you should know. So that when you're going to interview, you quickly look at the markets and know whether it's a big day or not. So you don't get embarrass yourself when you walk in as like. Oh, the SP is down 3%. Yeah, that's, that's not a big deal. No, that's, that's Bitcoin being down 3%. GameStop being down 3%. Who cares? But the SP down 3%. That's, that's a big deal. All right, so I'll do that next week. All right, thanks. <laughs>
That concludes our meeting today for the most part. Thank you. Uh, we do have a new social network. Uh, so join our Discord if y'all haven't. We have a new server. Well, the one from last week. It's not new, new. Um, and join our Telegram if you haven't. And be excited for the sector and classes coming up next week and even the week after. I think two other classes are starting. Uh, in case y'all need to take a photo of that as well. It's very important. I'm excited to take Sweet's class for sure because I'm going to have a lot of interviews, hopefully. And one final thing. Um, I did mention in our Telegram and Discord that we'll be selling these shirts here. It is limited um, availability and sizes. And there's only basically two designs. So in the front, I hope y'all can see it's the like bowl. And then our actual official investment society logo. They are five dollars each. Uh, first come, first serve. If your size is there or not, good luck. <laughs> but they are for sale just for today. And any questions on the shirts? I know I sent y'all a link to to fill out a survey because we are going to come up with more shirts for the semester that are going to be more official <laughs> than this. And we actually have a preview of what we're going to be making this semester. It's our polos. It's over here. <laughs> With our logo. Very fancy polo shirt. Any questions? Okay. I hope you all have a good day, night, and that finally concludes our meeting. Thank you all for joining.